welcome to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos, where industry leaders share their thoughts and experience on the future of space business, policy, and opportunity. If you like Constellations, please support us by giving a rating and review on iTunes. And don't forget to share this podcast online to help our community grow. Welcome to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos. My name is John Gilroy, and I'll be your moderator. Our guest today is Robert Cardillo, former director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, current distinguished fellow at Georgetown University's Center for Security and Emerging Technology, and founding member of Orbital Insights Federal Advisory Board. During this episode, we'll be talking about new developments, both good and bad, concerning artificial intelligence and machine learning, and we're recording this interview from the floor of Satellite 2020. Robert, having fun at the conference here? I'm having a great time, but I have a feeling it's about to get a little better. (laughs) Yeah, hopefully that's a little bit of fun here. Uh, Back in your NGA days, you said that monitoring and exploiting commercial and proprietary video and imagery feeds around the world is on the precipice of a data explosion, similar to when the internet took off. Has that growth met or exceeded your expectations? So, one, John, thanks for having me. I'm going to enjoy this conversation and uh, look forward to our exchange. I would say that since I've left government, it's been about a year now, the confidence I had before about that explosion has only been increased. As, as I become exposed to more and more companies and more and more innovators and more and more approaches to sensing our planet in a way to advance you know, humanity's cause... I have been refreshed and rewarded by those advances. And while I know there are concerns that we should uh, discuss today about the other side of all of that sensing, um, I'm quite confident that we're on a good path. You know, I heard the folks from Planet give a talk yesterday, and they talked about generating 11 terabytes of data every day. I mean, that's just a number. I mean, 10 years ago, would you believe that number? I mean, it's incredible. That's right. And, uh, and I'm sure tomorrow it's going to be more. Wow. So the question is, how do you analyze that data? Huh? So, one, you, uh, you, if you still have any sort of proclivity to doing it the way that Robert Cardillo did it as a young analyst, you need to get over that. What I mean by that is that if we don't take every advantage of uh, what I call automation, augmentation, and then eventually artificial intelligence, uh, we have no chance. And um, I, you jump to the, the verb analyze. I would, I would take it in stages before you even get there. I think there's a, there's a certain amount of just pre-processing that needs to happen, uh, filtering, uh, synthesizing, uh, 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 amalgamating in a way that gives you context. You do want to get to the point where you can make sense out of the, all that data, which gets you to analysis. But there's many stages on the way from one to the other. You know, a wise man once said, with all this information out there, all these terabytes of information, that uh, they have to try to derive coherence from chaos. Now, who's, who said that? Indeed. And it, it, it may have been coined in this hall <laughs> when we held the GEOINT Symposium here in uh, 2015. Um, well, look, I thought it was a catchy way it's to... It's a great line. I love to, it. I was thinking about that with all those terabytes. Attention. Uh, it fits on a bumper sticker, which is important these days. And interestingly, I was in the green room after my remarks in which I first used that phrase, and then the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Bob Work, was, was about to go on next. And uh, I took it as a great compliment that he turned to me and he said, I'm stealing your line (laughs) because it does work in many different scenarios. Stealing it fair and square. Well, there, of course, is much news about big data and artificial intelligence, machine language, space, data collection. How was NGA adapting to these developments as you left the agency? Well, let me put it this way. When I got to NGA, came back to NGA in 2014, NGA was in the midst of a debate, and the the central question of the debate was, should we, should we engage with these new companies and these, uh, what we would call non-traditional sources and partners? When I left NGA last year, so four and a half years as director, that debate had shifted from should we to how do we? Now, we hadn't finished answering that question, and I'm happy to talk more about where I think we made progress and where I think we need to make more progress. But, but we had moved to our front step. We were leaning into the question. We were leaning into the opportunity, and we were beginning to make progress. 
I see a lot of parallels with people talking about uh, uh, open data and open source software and, mm-hmm. and, and especially people in the intelligence community being kind of wary, but, you know, careful and, and examining options and trying to consider how it can work for them. Wary is appropriate. You know, as intelligence professionals, we're somewhat trained to be wary, you know, to be cautious, to be deliberate, because uh, that's in the nature of the tradecraft. What I would say, though, to my teammates who have that wary hold them back from perhaps engaging with the opportunity is that the day in which, you know, our profession was predominantly government-owned and operated is, is over. It doesn't mean the government's not a big player, not an important player, not a big contributor to the outcome. But if you think of the baseline of information that's available to all humans, the preponderance of that is open. And so if you're going to properly frame a question or an opportunity or issue a warning, you have to do it within that broader context. So engage with it, uh, sustain your wariness always, ask questions, be uh, deliberative, uh, but then carefully move to that point of decision and, and use you know, whatever government opportunity that you have to create a better outcome. Back when you started your career, the catchphrase was trust but verify. Maybe mm-hmm. pull it out of the woods from 40 years ago and apply it today, huh? I think it's the same. I just think we have less time between that trusting and that verifying. <laughs> I think it's a continual loop these days, whereas it was more segmented back in the, back in the day. All kinds of presentations are being given here at Satellite 2020, uh, artificial intelligence and space satellite operations and everything else. So what can you tell our audience about Sentient? This is a product that uses AI to analyze data of all sorts. Can you give us a clue what Sentient does? Sure. So Sentient is a, um, I'd call it a test bed that we were, we were pursuing uh, in the government to try to take technology that's either on this floor today, you know, a current off-the-shelf capability, or a new piece of research that's being tested and evaluated. Apply that technology, though, against government challenges. Um, You mentioned some of the conversations that are happening on the floor. I mean, I'm hearing things about agriculture improvement and environmental security and uh, water resources, all important things for humanity. Um, on the government side, we might want to take that same technology that, that would increase the yield of an agricultural effort, but apply it in a way that gives us insight to perhaps a threat or an opportunity. So Sentient was a way to bring those tools into the government space and then create a different outcome. Again, it could be based upon a military uh, employment of force, or it could be uh, on, the, on the reverse, it could be something to secure an area of great import. You know, if you take off your headphones, you can hear a presentation behind us, and they're talking about precision agriculture. And I never realized that they can, you know, they can plant seeds down to the centimeter now. I mean, it's, it's, it's really amazing part of what's going on now. Yes, indeed. I mean, like I said, I was, you know, I joined the community three and a half plus decades ago now. And when I joined, you know, if you needed to image, sense something uh, in an area that might be denied to you. So in those days, uh, the country was called the Soviet Union, and and that was a denied area. You had to learn how to fly a very large camera in space, and you had to learn how to figure out how you're going to get that image back down to the ground. To your point about the agricultural conversation behind us... um, that's a, that's a, that's, that could be a drone collection that's operated by the owner of, of the farm to create, you know, minute, detailed understanding of their agricultural production. And then to be able to tweak it, tune it, right, to create the outcome they seek with a higher yield and more income. So Santian can be used for um, doing some predicting of what's going to happen in the future. And and this is a really important part, I think, a lot of what Santian's doing. Is that correct? That's right. Um, Not everyone has the the issue, but since you raised the word, I'm I'm not big on prediction in the intelligence business. Um, I'm happy, you know, weather forecasters can do that. Uh, I prefer the term uh, anticipation or anticipatory. 
Because let's face it, at the end of the day, even with all these sensors and all this information coming in, what we're really trying to understand as an intelligence professional is what another human will do tomorrow. And humans are, remain complex you know, characters. And so um, I think I prefer to say the best thing I could do for a decision maker was to give him or her the most likely outcomes that we anticipate given our current understanding of a situation. And then that decision maker can then make a more informed, uh, arguably better decision about how they're going to behave or how they're going to act. Well, let's talk a little bit about humans. Hmm. You know, 2,000 years ago, a couple of humans came up with this phrase, who guards the guardian? Who watches the watchman, you know? And I think this is coming to more and more in favor of what's going to happen with what's going on in the world today. You know, when we were preparing for this podcast, you indicated that you had a strong interest in the concept of machines watching us. Machines watching machines. Back to ancient Rome, isn't it? Always kind of Indeed. So uh, can you explain your interest in these topics to our listeners? So in this... This will, I think, be a nice segue, John, into the conversation about the other side of this persistent, continual sensing that's ongoing. And what I mean by that is, is, you know, we've talked about some of the advantages and some of the insights and some of the improved outcomes that can be created through this sensing. Um, I think we also need to acknowledge and have a open conversation about what are the limits uh, that should be applied to the access to that data, to the use of it. Um, can it be applied in a way that enforces uh, a legal uh, uh, constriction? And, or can it be uh, used in a way that would inhibit you know, my sense of personal privacy? And the answer to those questions is yes, depending on where you're sitting at the time. So to go back to your central question, what I think we need to do is, is have conversations now about who's watching the watchers, meaning who's, who's monitoring the data that's being collected, how's it being stored, how can it be accessed. And, and while I have a strong belief that that conversation won't ever end, nor should it, I think having it will lead us to better decisions about the use of that data. You know, we both are involved in the university community, and this is a question that doesn't have a multiple choice answer, mm-hmm. is it? It's not a multiple choice answer. It's a long, involved answer that has to flex and change That's with right. what's going on in the show floor. That's right. I mean, it's, I, th- I believe strongly that this question, right, this challenge that we have is one that we're going to have to manage continually. Um, to your point, there's no, out, there's no date-specific outcome. We will have solved the issue of data. You know, we, we, you know, people talk about what's the balance between security and privacy, right? Like there's some midpoint in there that if we just found it, you know, we could just move on to the next Multiple challenge. choice, yeah. No. no it's think, like that. Uh, you know, I think the reality is, is the answer to the question is it depends. And so you have to be case-specific. You have to talk about, you know, what are the uses? What are the outcomes? You know, what are the implications, the consequence, et cetera? Um, but as soon as we conclude that conversation today, guess what? Uh, we'll have another one tomorrow. If you did a study, I'm sure you'd find that around 75 uh, out of 176 countries are uh, actively using AI technologies for surveillance purposes. So what is the risk of personal privacy as surveillance, especially government surveillance, becomes more pervasive? The risk is all around us. Um, so let me put it this way. Um, there, it's, it's difficult, if not impossible, to walk through a major urban center on this planet today and not be imaged almost continually. Some of that imaging will be, uh, could be local government, could be police, could be rescue, could be um, you know, local inf- law enforcement. Some of it is, and I would believe most of it is private, because you know, for security purposes and monitoring purposes, businesses, etc., uh, want to be able to secure their livelihood. Um, the question then becomes, as I'm transiting... Right, through public space, but now being sensed through both public, police, or private company sensing technology, 
Um, one, I think that's our reality today. I don't think there's any reverse switch on this. I don't think we can, we're going to go back. Um, two, though, I do believe we should have more conversations about your question about uh, how could that be used either for me, okay, so personal security, uh, you know, to counter crime, for example, or against me if, say, for example, I didn't have an interest in someone knowing that I was in this part of town at this time of day. And so to me, that, again, is the conversation that, that needs to be elevated. Who has access, who has control, and who has use? I think everyone listening remembers the Bourne movies. There's a famous Bourne movie. They were on a train station. All the cameras were watching him, right? They were directing mm-hmm. at him and trying to find out where he's at. Uh, and I think that's traditional what you think of surveillance, you know. Uh, AI-supported cameras, maybe. Um, and, you know, they're on a train station or a lamp post in London or a convenience store down the street. What happens if what's the surveillance goes up in the air, goes up into satellites? What happens when we no longer wear the fact that we're being watched and analyzed? So... John, I hate to break it to you, but it's not a future (laughs) tense question. Uh, Because even though you and I are, because of my background, talking more about imaging, you know, uh, photographs, uh, that sensing from space is happening now. You and I will have a smartphone on our person uh, most of the time. When we open up any mapping application on that smartphone, you'll see a blue dot which identifies your location. Now, the reason that blue dot appears on your phone is because there's at least three satellites at geostationary orbit, so 23,500 miles above us, that are triangulating our position continually. I consider that sensing. Now, we are, I'll say I am okay with that blue dot because it helps me find my coffee sooner, get home in a more efficient way, avoid uh, traffic, etc. However, though, the corollary... Uh, question is is I think germane. Who else can use that blue dot? And if you combine the locational information in today's technology with that CCTV camera that might have some facial recognition that can say, oh, that's just not a generic blue dot, that's the Cardillo blue dot. And look at the pattern he has set up or look at who he's meeting with or um, and what can we infer about that? Um, I do think there is some risk uh, to the latter. Let's talk a little more about uh, surveillance here. Now, in, in, in many countries, such surveillance is marketed as crime prevention or counterterrorism. We've seen it being pushed a step further in other countries and used to suppress political activity and for social control. Those are kind of scary words. So what's the risk of this application spreading to more countries? I don't think it's a risk. I think it's a reality. I don't think there's going to be, as I said earlier, I don't think there's anything that's going to slow this trend. Um, I actually believe that the, the, the governments, and in, in, you know, my experience with the U.S. government, policy development around this question is trailing the technology. Um, in some ways, that's good. In, in a sense that you know, uh, you know, the way this country works, and, and in a market based economy. You want innovation to move quickly and you want companies to be agile, etc. However, I think when it moves so quickly um, that the government can't keep up, which I think is the case now, I think it gets to your question about the, the downside risk. Let me put it this way, uh, John. I think, as I said, I believe that our current sensed world is going to continue to grow and to become more complex. I would offer that in such a world, I would be in favor of the liberally, liberalization of that data. What I mean by that is the open sharing of that data so that we have, I'll say, a kind of a common level of transparency in which, again, we've, to go back to my blue dot, we have found at least some level of comfort. Now, I'm sure that doesn't, isn't a word everyone will use about that blue dot because of the advantages that we create from it or we gain from it. I think we're going to have to find a similar level of comfort with this enhanced awareness. And, I, and again, I believe strongly that the more we share it equally across um, society, I think the safer or, or the less chance we'll have to the downside to your inappropriate use of government you know, action, for example. You know, Robert, thousands of people from all over the world have listened to this podcast. If you're listening now, just go to Google, type in Constellations Podcast. 
to get to our show notes page. Here, you can get transcripts for all 71 interviews. Also, you can sign up for free email notifications. We have folks like Robert in the next next six or seven months. I mean, it's kind of tough to beat this interview. So, Robert, I'm going to read a quote, and you tell me who said it, okay? You ready? All right. Here we go. <clears throat> Geography is destiny. <laughs> uh-huh. You should know that one. So, um, Napoleon? Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Um, and your world. Look, uh, you know, people, you know, oftentimes with a, with a kind of a scary, well, scary, sometimes a confusing name. What is geospatial? What is this geospatial intelligence right. thing, et cetera? Uh, I would talk to, especially in public, I would have to explain to people what this thing is. And I used to say, I said, look, the first time somebody moved into a cave, one of our forefathers or foremothers, they became interested in who was living next door. And then the first time somebody delineated, this is my property and that's your property, and put some sort of barrier, a fence or a wall in between it, one became interested in what was happening on the other side of that fence or that wall. Good things or perhaps uh, threatening things. That's geography, right? I mean, the humans, humans have always been interested in where they are, where their friends are, and where there might be risks. Um, I think Napoleon's uh, application clearly had, well, it was directly tied to the outcome that he sought. Yeah. And so I don't think that's changed. I do think that there are good and bad uses of it. And I think, we, I think again, the more we have these conversations, the, the better we all, all, all will be. Before we took the little break there, um, we were talking about surveillance, and you were touching on the word transparency, but you were just kind of uh, you know, getting close to actually say the word transparency. Let's talk about what's going on today. You know, last month, San Francisco became the first city to ban facial recognition technology by police and other government agencies. A similar ban is being considered in up in Massachusetts and Somerville, out in California and in Oakland. Now, I think these are the exceptions as for today. But more liberal areas of the country uh, have some concerns. Do you think that measures such as these are an overreaction, or is this just transparency, or what does this all mean? Uh, I wouldn't, I, first of all, I wouldn't say overreaction. I would, I would, I, I'm, again, to my point about having this conversation and this debate and the discussion we're having today, I think these are appropriate. I, these conversations are appropriate. And, and look, we, you know, we live in a society in which we elect officials to kind of manage the social compact between government and civilian, between privacy and between security. You've mentioned a couple of, you know, elected officials and entities that have made some decisions about limits that they want to put on the technology because, in their mind, the risk, okay, to that sensing, to that transparency, is outweighing the benefit. I mean, it's a choice that they're making. So I'm all in favor of people making choices. I just would want them to be as informed as possible. And, again, I'm not questioning whether or not those decisions were informed. I assume they are or were. Um, what I'd like to do is to contribute to the conversation so that that next decision is, again, as done in, in as much light as possible. I want to go back to that Bourne movie. They were just trying to identify a face, okay? Who is this guy, Jason Bourne, and what happens in the plot of the movie? But I think there are companies today that are developing products that attempt to infer and predict emotions, Mm. intentions, and anomalous behavior from facial expressions, body language and voice and tone, even direction of a gaze. I think that's maybe moving into a a little more dangerous area than that's Jason Bourne over there, isn't it? I think it could be, but again, let let me say, and and by the way, I don't I don't have you know time inside of the TSA and Homeland Security, but I've worked with them. But I am aware that, and this isn't just in our country, that for a long time people have been looking for um, signs or telltale indicators of nefarious activity. You know, somebody's pacing outside of a bank, or somebody's uh, surveilling you know a movement of an armored truck, etc. And the reason that you would do that is you wanted to make sure that, you know, the bank or the the truck was secure. And so, again, humans have always been looking for those signs. I hear you, okay, that we're now taking algorithmic applications, applying them to facial features and trying to infer, anticipate, you know, a future activity. I do think because of the scale question, because it's one thing for humans to look for, you know, somebody acting funny. It's another thing for a machine to look at thousands of people, you know, over a long period of time. So I'm not, I'm not disparaging the question. I just think that we need to scale it in a way that gets us to, 
as I said, the best answer we can today and then a, and a, and a better one tomorrow. Well, if we talked about Jason Bourne, we got to talk about Lady Gaga. <laughs> she has okay. a famous song called Poker Face, huh? Okay. Poker Face. It seems to me that uh, there are some scientific warnings that facial expressions and other external behaviors are not reliable indicator of mental or emotional states. It's a poker face out there. So how worrying is that, trying to draw conclusions from your poker face or not a poker face? Huh? Um, I, not something I worry about. I, and, I, and I guess because, as I, if I said, you know, humanity, human interaction... You know, I think has some fundamental qualities to it. Um, you know, we're constantly going through our day without algorithms right now. Okay, we're not wearing the the algorithmic glasses that <laughs> are projecting, you know, an assessment of your facial reaction to my comment. But we're all looking for those tells today: body language, or a nod, or you know, a an expression. To understand whether or not, oh, am I making my point? Uh, is this is this a safe environment? Um, should I trust this person? I think we're making all those judgments uh, constantly anyway. Um, I agree that we need to be careful as we apply the machine filter to that. Um, but I don't think it fundamentally changes. Again, what what is the human challenge of how do I make it day? How how do I make it through a day in the most efficient way and the most effective outcome? Uh, there's an ACLU report out called uh, "The Dawn of Robot Surveillance." Talks about all these uh, identification characteristics and and. Uh just, you know, it would seem to me that if I were to bring this up in a conversation of 8th graders or 10th graders, even high school kids, they may talk about their or- the Orwell book they had to read and go, well, this is all like George Orwell. This is really what's going on. It's, it, you think it's leading towards that? Well, look, I, th- I think Orwell's warning is, is in re- you know, has been and remains germane. Um, I, I would offer another book. Um, this is by David Brin. Um, who wrote The Transparent Society. And in the beginning of that book, David laid out a couple of scenarios in the future. And, and you know, one was, uh, it, but by the way, both states looked Orwellian, okay, because, you know, everything was surveilled continually. But the two differences he laid out between the two outcomes, one is it was all that surveillance was shared amongst everyone to include the police station and the interrogation room and et cetera, so that people could self-monitor other, you know, government behavior. The other outcome was the Orwellian solution in which that data only went to police headquarters, and so it was ah. kept. And David challenged the reader to say, which, which outcome would you prefer? Again, I've already told you my preferred outcome. If we're going to move to such a society, I'd prefer that it be open and shared across everyone versus it held by the state. What's, what I love about David's challenge is he wrote that in 1996. Wow. Uh, Pressing. He was yeah. way ahead of his time in thinking about these challenges. Well, we are at the satellite conference, so we've got to go from these heavy, serious ACL conversations to the sky. So um, what happens when surveillance shifts from terrestrial cameras to satellites? Good or bad? Is that, how is that going to impact everything? Um, I mean, I would argue, given my background and my experience, I would say good. But I'd also say good or bad, um, it's going to continue. And the reason is is, 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 is nothing to do with governmental use. It's commercial use. There is monetization. There is commoditization available with access to space. And so that reality will take companies from this floor, uh, both you know, launchers, satellite builders, and then analytic applications on the other end, and continue to create more and more of them. I think the bigger question, um, which we've been talking about now uh, here during this podcast, is the, okay, so that data is going to exist... How can it be used? All right. How could it be misused? And who decides when it's the former vice the latter? Well, if we started this conversation with Jason Bourne, we've got to end it with Arnold Schwarzenegger. That makes perfect sense, uh, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, I saw that coming. Yeah, he probably did. <laughs> And Skynet, you know, and the convergence of everything. I have a grandson, and is he going to see Skynet? Is he going to see a conversion? Is he going to see the singularity where all these cameras get together and they merge with artificial intelligence and storage? And, and uh, that could be a significant change to human civilization. 
Uh, how old's your grandson? <laughs> He's uh, two months old. <laughs> yeah. So I think one question is, will your grandson ever need or want to get a driver's license? That's a better question, isn't it? Yeah. The reason being, you know, autonomous self-driving vehicles will appear before he turns 16. Okay, right. that, That's for sure. Um, he'll make a choice at that time as whether or not, you know, it's worth the trouble and the cost, et cetera, et cetera, to... Uh, and I'm just going to make an assumption uh, that the young man will find that to be an advantage, that he has that choice uh, at that point. Um, okay, if, if, if you, know, I'll, you know, most of the vehicles on the planet in 15 years from now are autonomously uh, uh, navigated, there's almost no way to do that without some form of Skynet, meaning... <laughs> Those vehicles, you know, that singular vehicle doesn't exist in and of itself. It exists within a network and a system, and and all of the vehicles have to be synced. And so, I guess I'm telling you, I think we're going there anyway. I appreciate, you know, the Schwarzenegger warning, <laughs> okay, that that Skynet can be used nefariously, mm-hmm. and and that's why I think this conversation is so important. You know, let's not let's not just kind of you know blindly head into this this world in which everything is interconnected. Let's talk about it in a way that keeps it, I think, above the table, and I think it in an open way, and 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 I'll say in a liberal Western, you know, uh, democratic low lowercase D society. I think that's to our great advantage, the more that we can share. Instead of a brave new world, a transparent new world, maybe that's a, another bumper another sticker. Bumper we sticker. Yeah, we got three things. Transparent new great. world, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there's very few conversations like this taking place in the shore of, of the floor here of Satellite 2020, but Robert, unfortunately, we are running out of time. I'd like to thank our guest, Robert Cardillo, former director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and current distinguished fellow at Georgetown University Center for Security and Emerging Technology. Thanks for listening to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos. If you like this interview, please subscribe, tell a friend, and give us a review.